So I'm an environmental consultant. It's sort of what I do. It's my thing. Um, and I represent the state of Montana in a lot of things considering butte to do with butte priority soils. And I just wanted to clarify that I am not here in that capacity. Um, I'm not representing the state of Montana in this, this instance. This is my, you know, I mean, I came back to Butte in June. And the decision had been made to remove the parrot tailings, and I, you know, everybody was asking, why do we want to remove the parrot tailings? It's pretty expensive, and and so I'd been gone for four years, and I really just wanted the opportunity to kind of give a summary view on the scientific rationale why the why the parrot tailings need to go, and so um, I'm going to do that, and, but I'm not in any f official capacity, so that's my little disclaimer. So, um, yeah, so we'll just move on. This, uh, this is the pair of tailings. This is kind of an oblique aerial view looking to the southwest. Um, this was actually taken by Fritz Daly, this picture in an airplane. Um, and this red outline here is the removal boundary for the pair of tailings. So here's the Civic Center. Here's the Butte County shops. Silver Bow Creek kind of comes and winds in through here. And so we're going to be talking about that today. This is the 1905 Weed, Walter Harvey Reed uh, USGS map. And it's, it's one of the windows we have into the past. And we can look into the past. And it, I like it for several reasons. One, because it shows where the parrot smelter was. The parrot smelter was right here. Um, it's important to note that there were at least four or five other smelters upgradient of of the parrot smelter and they all had their own uh, tailings dams. Those dams are still in existence but they are on the other side of the groundwater divide that goes through the area and all of this water reports north to the Berkeley pit so it's in essence captured and so that's why the parrot tailings is so important because it's on that the south side of that groundwater divide and that water starts to flow towards the southwest towards Silver Bow Creek. So this was the tailings pond from the Parrot smelter. Um, there was a dam right here. And these are contour, these contour intervals right here are 20 foot high slag piles that they would dump out there. And actually when you drill, the lithology sh still so shows those slag piles. So it's kind of kind of cool. So, you know, you got the feeling that everything is sort of still in place from how it was left, and that's that's that is true. And so this is one of the earliest pictures of the parrot smelter. This was it's the reason why it's such bad quality. Um, this was in the Anaconda Standard, and I can't remember the date of it, but so they were operating the parrot tailings, and then they were just sort of extruding the tailings out onto the floodplain and then they were letting the creek do its thing and take away their tailings for them. But uh, that was having a number of issues. It was killing cows and it was causing a lot of aggrandizement and flooding issues. And so they decided to pond those, pond those areas up and, and make tailings ponds. And uh, you could see that in a, in a series of successive series of these pictures. Here are the pair of tailings. This is before the dam operated, or this is when the dam, were, dam was in place. The dam was downgrading in here. And these are the tailings all along that, that floodplain. This is Silver Bow Creek, and this is actually a guy taking an assay, and he was working for the plaintiff in a lawsuit that the, the downgradient farmers and ag people were suing the upgradient miners at the time. And the, I think it was the Anaconda Company, but I might be wrong about that. Here's a really good one of the Butte Reduction Works. It shows Silver Bow Creek coming straight through. And then just as far as the eye can see tailings. This is, these were the Colorado, Colorado and Butte Reduction Work tailings. And these were actually removed, and I'm going to talk about that. But this was interesting because this is another thing. Um, but when the, when the 1908 flood hit, it was a 100-year flood event. And that single event mobilized and transported all these tailings you see here down gradient all the way to the nearest dam which at that time was the newly constructed Milltown Dam. So you could imagine all those tailings, that's millions of cubic yards of tailings that just in that one event just got transported downstream and that's sort of 
what the state has been spending several million dollars a mile on remediating Silverbow Creek for. But that has nothing to do with the parrot tailings. So here's another picture of the, the tailings pond. Here's the parrot smelter, and the, t the tailings themselves were pretty large. And so the focus feasibility study came out in 2004, um, February 19th, 2004, and this is the focus feasibility study for groundwater remedy throughout the upper Silverbow Creek drainage. And that remedy was basically um, uh, ca groundwater capture and treatment. So they would install a subdrain, they would collect groundwater, and then they would divert that or convey that, ground, that contaminated groundwater over to lower area one where they would add lime to the water, the metals would drop out, the water would be clean, and they could discharge that back into Silverbow Creek. Um, they, 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 you know, the, the groundwater was contaminated, so they created an exclusion area, and that is the technical impracticability studies, technical impracticability zone. And they basically said all water within that zone is contaminated, the aquifer could never be cleaned up. So we're sort of writing that section of the aquifer off and we're gonna pump and treat in perpetuity. And uh, it's not really clear what in perpetuity, the, the, the time frame of in perpetuity is, but it's a very, very long time. Okay. So, um, so that's what the, that's what the, you know, so that's what the remedy was. I'm trying to think if I missed anything. I don't think that I have. Um, the rod was finalized and published in September of 2006. The reaction to that decision was immediate. Um, this is a letter, this was prior to the rod, this was in 2004, um, by a group of 17 local scientists that worked on mining related issues in and around Butte. And I really like this letter because um, you know, it's, you know, we are a group of geoscientists and we spent our lives on working in mine, mine waste and we don't believe you characterize this site to the extent necessary for the finalization of a rod. And they gave a whole slew of reasons why that they did that, but you know, I mean, they basically, they drilled a bunch of shallow wells um, and characterized the whole aquifer. And the aquifer at the Parrot is at least 300 feet deep. Um, and so, they, you know, there were data gaps that existed and EPA agreed to that and uh, funded the f one of the first bureau investigations, Montana Bureau of Mines investigations on this site. And that was an investigation done by John Medish and James Madison who's sitting right over there. And uh, basically what they concluded was there were these deeper alluvial units, interbedded units of sands and gravels that were acting as conduits for COCs and transporting those COCs from the Parrot on down gradient. And at the time, they didn't really have a full characterization of it, but, he d but what they, the great thing that they did do was they were the first to describe those units. And they're now today collectively referred to as the middle alluvial and the lower alluvial aquifer units of the Summit Valley alluvial aquifer. Um, they also conducted a column study of the contaminated sediments where they would flush the contaminated sediments with clean groundwater to determine how fast the, the aquifer would clean up once the tailings had been removed. And um, it's less than 100 years. Now that might seem like a long time, but you know, I mean, we calculated in one of our reports when I worked for the Bureau that it would take upwards of tens of thousands of years for the aquifer to naturally re um, reach restoration with uh, the tailings being removed. Without the tailings being removed, I apologize. And so this sort of, this investigation sort of opened up a Pandora's box, which we spent the next 10 years um, trying to figure this all out. And that's where I sort of became involved. I graduated in 2005 with my master's degree, um, and then I started to become involved with this site. Um, this is the last historic document. This is the opera letter. It sort of set the tone for the state um, where it was partial, partial concurrence with the rod. They thought that most of it, 95% of 
the remediation they agreed with, but they disagreed with leaving the wastes in place. Um, and so the NRD started funding, Natural Resource Damage Program, started funding a series of investigations. And concurrent to this, EPA and ARCA were also doing their own investigation. And I do want to back up because, you know, I mean, when they, when they did, when they installed the subdrain, the subdrain is pretty effective. It has lowered um, contaminants in, in streams significantly. And so it is doing what it, is, it was designed to do. It's designed to capture shallow groundwater and convey that to lower area one. And as soon as that thing went online, you could just see significant reductions in copper and zinc in the creek. And so um, I don't want to sit here and like point fingers at people. I mean, this was, this was, this was designed to do what it was, it's doing what it was designed to do. Um, but there's those lower units of concern that are conveying contaminated groundwater. And um, so we did this series of investigations. Um, and to all the young professionals in this area out here today, the students, when you get out into the real world and you start working on sites, the most important thing you could do is this task. If I could find it. <laughs> <laughs> Historic document review. If you get working on a site, the first thing you want to do is you want to start cracking open the books and, and convince your client that you should be paid to, to do that, that work because it is the most, I spent literally eight months of my life reviewing historic documents for this site from 1977, from the first Anaconda Minerals report, all the way to 2009. There's thousands and tens of thousands of pages of documents and I reviewed most of those. Um, and it gave me just this whole holistic view of this site and I can't, ex I can't express the importance of doing that activity for every site you work on. So, but there are other things that we did. Um, James Madison and John Medish did this investigation and this investigation. Tetra Tech did this in data gap investigation. And Gary Agapini and I were involved in the rest of them. We did, uh, we did a big drilling investigation at the Parrot to characterize the source, to determine if it was still a source. We did a geochemical fingerprinting investigation. We did a uh, Blacktail Creek Tracer investigation. We looked at the diggings east and the north side tailings. And uh, now we're doing a performance monitoring work plan. So, so I'm here to talk today about the things that I worked on that I have firsthand knowledge of and really nothing else. Um, I don't want to, oh, you know, speak to anything that I didn't really have involvement with. And uh, my work was through the BNRC, the Butte Natural Resource Council, who made the decision, who, well, not didn't make the decision, they made the recommendation to the governor to remove the parrot tailings based on this information and the governor decided to remove the tailings. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I got a lot of reports out of it. I call this slide the etymology of my cover page <laughs> <laughs> abilities. You can see a dramatic improvement of my cover pages over time. <laughs> so. And so when you look at the parrot tailings, it really is a tale of two sources. The Anaconda Company was discharging 20 CFS of mine water to, the Silver, upper, uh, to Silver Bow Creek, right around Texas Avenue. And that made its way down to, this is a picture taken at Texas Avenue. And this is a picture that Joe Griffin's wife, Sherry, found in the archives. I love this picture so much, because it just says so much. But I'll, I'll get to that. But they were discharging 20 CFS, which is 9,000 gallons per minute, of mine water. This is very high iron, very high COCs. And this was discharging into the aquifer, and it was its own source. Um, and you could see this plume of water coming down, and this is, this is Silver Bow Creek. I guess this, the uh, Chamber of Commerce building would be right here. This is Blacktail Creek. This is children 
playing and fishing in the creek, and they were all there because the fish were most likely dead yeah. down, <laughs> down the stream. But I just love that picture. And so, and so you could imagine that there was a lot of loss, a lot of leakage from this channel. And uh, that did two things. It, added, it did add contamination to the aquifer, but it also added iron oxides to the aquifer. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then the second source are the tailings piles that have been left in place. So you have the Diggings East tailings pile, you have the North Side tailings pile, and you have, well, this is the Diggings East, this is the Parrot, and this is the North Side tailings pile. And then you also have the Blacktail Creek berm right here. And those are all recognized significant sources of contamination to the Louisville Aquifer. This is a picture that Pat Kaneen pulled up, found in the archives, and it actually shows the outline of the Parrot tailings. And it shows the parrot tailings once had so much copper in them that they mined the copper out of the tailings. And the way that they did that was through copper cementation. They had these, um, basically, they had these, this conveyor system going where they would add acid, they would leach the copper out of the water, and then they would cement the copper out of the water. And that added a lot of acid to the system. And the reason why I like this figure is that they show where these operations were. Right here and right here. Now, GS41 S and D, which are the most contaminated um, wells, is located about right here. And all of this right here is getting removed. That's pretty important. And so I talked about a tale of two sources, right? And so in our geochem in the Bureau's geochemical fingerprint analysis that we did, we isolated multiple different sources. Uh, there was the parrot plume, and it was pretty extensive. Um, we found it uh, at that time in 2012. The tail of the, the plume um, was at the was basically under the KOA. Um, there is the Diggings East plume, and then the, the North Side plume, and then there's another plume at this site, and that is the Silver Bowl Creek <coughs> plume. And that is pretty much right here. And the way that we were able to isolate that plume is by the decreasing concentrations in COCs over time seen in that area, in groundwater wells in that area. So, um, this is the first reason um, for um, removing the parrot tailings because removal works. Um, this is, these are time concentration plots for copper and zinc over time in various areas of, of the corridor. And uh, the parrot tailings is, 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 is not, it's, it, it increased early in the, in the 2000s, but then it sort of leveled off at around a million parts per billion copper, which is leachate concentration copper. But then in this area right here, where that, where that Silver Bow Creek plume was, you have significantly decreasing concentrations of copper and zinc in the aquifer. And so you remove that source, and it was followed, that, that liquid source, um, and basically that was just done by, in 1982, the Anaconda Mine Company switched to a zero-point discharge system, so they stopped discharging contaminated groundwater to Silver Bow Creek. So you remove that source, that was followed immediately by de rapid decreases of copper and zinc in the aquifer. And they're still decreasing to this day. And that sort of shows those concentrations all blowed up. The second area I want to talk to you about is the Colorado tailings removal, which happened in 1996. They removed over 2.2 million cubic yards of material, and uh, you could you could see the the depth of which they did it. That's the organic silt layer that's really significantly hot in the in the Parrot tailings area. But once they removed that, and I did not do this this analysis. This analysis was independently done by CTEX consultant Kirk Environmental. But what they concluded was the removal of the Colorado tailings resulted in significant groundwater improvement in that area. So removal works. 
So reason number two. All right. Um, the groundwater rem moves relatively rapidly through in those lower alluvial units. You have, we did ARCO, EPA ordered and ARCO conducted a 72-hour um, aquifer test on those lower alluvial units. And the Bureau went out and fitted all of these red dots, these are wells, with pressure transducers. And so it was a highly instrumented study. And what pressure transducers do is they were set up to monitor on 15 second intervals, measure water level, and response to pumping. And what we found were that hydraulic conductivities were a lot higher in those lower, lower units than originally, believed, originally thought. And what does that mean, hydraulic conductivities? Well, that means very rapid. Oh, so another thing we learned from this investigation was that the response to pumping in the shallow aquifer, um, that area of influence is in this polygon right here. And the response to pumping in that middle alluvial unit is in that, this unit right here. And what that means is because there's such widespread response, in those lower, lower units, much more so than the shallow unit, that those lower units are con confined from the surface. That's important. Um, but another thing that's important is that um, this well right here was the farthest down gradient well we had um, that was completed in the middle alluvial unit. So we didn't have any data from here, so we don't really know what the response was down in this area right here. But it's important because those middle alluvial units are confined from that, that, that shallow unit, meaning that they can't, they are prevented, physically prevented from moving upward into the shallow aquifer, at least up to that location right there. So the subdrain goes, it starts um, right here in the upper Silver Bowl Creek and it kind of winds down through here, comes along here and terminates right here. And so it, that plume is bypassing two thirds of the, of the sub drain. And so the ground, the biggest or the most significant conclusion from that aquifer test was that very rapid groundwater velocities. Um, groundwater travel time, so it takes a molecule of water to enter the middle of the unit here. 0.75, three quarters to three years to, to manifest itself down under KOA. It's very rapid, very quick. Now, one, to me, one of the most significant reasons to remove the parrot tailings is that it's the only area in the entire underlying, well, it's the only source area that is capable of contaminating deeper depths of the aquifer. You have confining conditions underneath the north side and diggings east, tailings, piles. You also have upward vertical gradients, and vertical gradients are basically hydraulic heads. So you have a nested well pair, you measure the water level in the shallow well, you measure the water level in the lower, deeper wells, and if, it's, if, if the water level in the shallow well is higher, Groundwater has a tendency to move downwards. Conversely, if the water level in the deeper well is, is higher than that of the shallow well, groundwater wants to move upwards. The pair tailings is the only area where there's downward vertical gradients. So not only do you have nothing prohibiting groundwater from reaching lower depths, you also have the driver. And that's why I think the pair tailings should be prioritized. Everybody's seen the blue water. Um, I put this this up there to show the connectivity of those, oh, the 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 continuity of those lower flow zones. So you have you have a plume extending in those lower flow zones from the parrot all the way down through to at least the KOA, and you see that in the general water quality. These are stiff diagrams, which basically give you an indication of how, m how many analytes are dissolved in groundwater. It tells you how, you know, 
it tells you basically if you have contaminated water or not. The bigger the stiff diagram, the more contaminated it is. And so these are stiff diagram. This is the parrot. So I guess this is a cross section. Let me start with the cross section. And it goes from the parrot and it follows the direction of groundwater flow all the way to Blacktail Creek. These are the stiff diagrams of the shallow alluvial aquifer. These are the stiff diagrams for the middle alluvial aquifer. Now you, in the shallow alluvial aquifer, you see the parrot tailings significantly. This little red outline here is the parrot tailings right here. You can see the influence of the parrot tailings and then a significant decrease just down gradient. And then you see the influence of the, the north side tailings and the diggings east tailings right here and then it goes down and then you see the influence of another the, the other local tailings piles down by Blacktail Creek and so you see a source and then you see a reduction and I honestly think that that is the sub drain doing its thing but then when you get to the middle alluvial unit you see one source area followed by a constant decrease in TDS and those stiff diagrams all the way down to basically the confluence area. So that's telling you that that unit is con fairly continuous and it's traveling um, um, pretty far down gradient. So natural attenuation is a pretty important concept at this site and the reason why is because those deeper flow units um, the copper and zinc in those deeper flow units are decreasing along the flow path. And the reason why that is is because there are, you know, there are natural, physical, and chemical, and biological factors that are acting naturally to reduce those concentrations along those, the flow path. So Remedy is being significantly aided with natural attenuation. And you can see that in the spatial analysis of of copper and zinc. Again, same, same flow path. Groundwater flow is in this typical direction. Parrot tailings is here. Again, we're following that same flow path and you could see a six to seven order magnitude reduction in copper and zinc. Now, so how do you know if that's dilution, if that's some kind of na other natural attenuation mechanisms? Well, you compare that to other analytes that are dissolved in solution along with the copper and zinc that would not be impacted by anything other than dilution. And so we did that. We looked for conservative analytes in the plume and we were able to determine that sulfate and lithium were acting pretty conservatively, yet you're only seeing a two order magnitude difference reduction in sulfate and lithium along that same flow path. So there are three to four orders of magnitude of copper and zinc reduction that are being impacted, that, are, that, are, that is occurring, and it's occurring due to other natural attenuation mechanisms. So what are those mechanisms? So we looked at that in the fingerprint analysis. Um, there, there, there are a number of different natural attenuation mechanisms. There's, there's dilution, there's mineral precipitation, there's co-precipitation, and there's absorption. So, And there's a difference between those attenua attenuation mechanisms because some of them are finite, meaning those natural attenuation mechanisms run out of steam over time. And there are infinite attenuation mechanisms, meaning the life, those attenuation mechanisms will be around for the life of the parrot plume. And so we looked at all of these and we determined that adsorption onto iron oxides is most likely the primary attenuation mechanism that are occurring in those lower flow units, in the middle alluvial aquifer unit and the lower alluvial aquifer unit. Now, how, do we, how did we tell that? So I'm gonna get to that now. And so this is along that same flow path. This is, this is iron, this is zinc, and this is copper. And iron drops out to, to levels below um, detection along the flow path before copper and zinc start to drop out significantly along the flow path. And so absorption onto iron oxides that are forming in the plume themselves 
was ruled out. So that leaves iron oxides um, forming uh, in the that are that are iron oxide stained class that are in the aquifer. And so to show that iron oxides were not forming in the in the uh, the alluvial aquifer, we uh, we did an experiment, and actually Gary Agapini, who joined us, he's right there, who was very very um, significant in all of these investigations. Um, we uh, we drilled core during the 2011 UAO, and instead of seeing these red stained class in the middle alluvial aquifer unit, we saw these green stained class in the middle alluvial unit. This is the contact between the middle alluvial unit um, and the upper clay confining bed, and uh, it's green. So why is it green? Well, those are green rusts, and that's an important thing because as green rust forms in, in the plume, um, it will not co-precipitate, or it will co-precipitate copper and zinc much less than iron oxides do. So that's the attenuation mechanism for, for iron, iron in the plume. And we showed that by taking some of the contaminated water quality from, or from some of the water quality from a well near this, this location, and that's it right there. And then we just added a buffer agent to it, which was sodium hydroxide. Lo and behold, it turned green. So iron oxide formation in the plume is not the main attenuation mechanism. So that leaves attenuation onto iron stained class um, in, the, in, the, in, in those lower flow zones. And so why are there so many iron stained class down there? Well, again, you had, this is, this is basically a, a picture of the lithology from zero to 50 feet of a well that was completed right here. And uh, you could see from here to here, which is basically 25 feet to 35 feet below ground surface, um, you see these seriously red stained class. So why is that significant? So when the plume was, when, the, when Silverbow Creek was flowing down um, the drainage like this, those iron oxides were f going into the, into the aquifer. They were staining those class. They were precipitating out onto those class. And that is the main attenuation mechanism for iron, for COCs in those aquifers. So why is that significant? Because that is a finite attenuation mechanism. Um, absorption onto, Absorption onto sediments and aquifer sediments is kind of like a sponge. You know, I mean, there's only so many attenuation sites on each class. And as contaminated water moves through that, through that aquifer material, it's precipitate, it's absorbing out onto those clasts, and there reaches a point where it can't handle anymore. So then the plume then advances on down gradient. So that's the next reason. Um, you, the potential for plume breakthrough in the future is, is real. It's uh, the uncertainty involved with long-term effectiveness of remedy is, is, is pretty great because of that. And I don't know for certain if we've seen plume breakthrough um, in, those middle alluvial, in that middle alluvial unit. And that's mostly a function of monitoring the, you know, there was only one l deep well during the RI, and that well was right here. That's GS9. And between the r RI data, which is the late 1990s, and oh God, 2004, 2005, there are significant increases in that well of copper and zinc. And is that, a, is that an indication of plume breakthrough? So you have, you have the parrot plume moving through those, those, those middle alluvial units. They're coming down through, you know, and precipitating out onto those, or absorbing out onto those class. And then they hit a point, they advance. They hit a point, they advance. And so I think that is an indication of that advancement. We see similar um, instances. Um, we just saw one in G MSD4. Um, which is on the 
southern tail of the plume and we see it further on down gradient. So the plume seems to be stable for now in this area right here, which is the confluence area. And that, I, th I hypothesize and I believe that that is a function of the fact that there are just so many red stain class down there that there, those contaminants are, are currently absorbing onto those, those, unit, those units. And you have a constant source of COCs. You have a constant source of acid to those, those units at the parrot. And, they're, and those absorption sites are being used up as we speak. So I think, you know, from, from a risk perspective, I believe personally that this is the number one reason to remove the pair tailings, is to re eliminate that source of uncertainty. We also did a tracer investigation. Um, we added sodium bromide um, to the creek. Into, this was the last thing I did before I left. We added sodium bromide to Blacktail Creek up here. And what that did was that gave us a constant method for determining flow in the creek based on the tracer dilution method. So, you know, based on the dilution of bromide, you know what your concentration of bromide here is. And then you know what you, you, you analyze for your concentration of bromide down here. And based on that amount of dilution is a function of how much groundwater is coming, fresh groundwater that doesn't contain bromide is coming into the creek. And so we saw an area where um, copper was increasing, lo copper load and, cop and copper concentrations were increasing in this area right here. And so, don't know where that's from, don't know if that's parrot tailings, don't know if that's a local source, but this, this investigation was actually followed up by a recent groundwater surface water investigation that the EPA conducted and they disagreed with me. They found that contaminated groundwater was actually under the creek and discharging in certain areas throughout this reach. And this is the end of Slide Canyon. And so, and so there are, there are, there is contaminated groundwater entering the creek in that, in that, in that reach. It's not high enough to exceed um, any of the RAOs, so the, any of the, the cleanup goals, you know, I mean, you have an MCL for copper, you have an MCL for, for zinc. The, 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 the copper and zinc coming into the creek at this time is not high enough to exceed those, those standards, but there's that question of the long-term effectiveness of attenuation. You know, that, there's that, that attenuation mechanism is acting on that plume and now, and ARCO is doing a good job now of, of keeping copper and zinc out of the creek. But this has never been a critique of rem the current remedy. It's always the long-term risks associated with the protectiveness of Blacktail and Silverbow Creek. And so, I don't know if you guys have saw this in the newspaper. And I, where are we on time? I have no idea how long I've been talking. Am I over? I'm way over, aren't I? Okay. Okay. All right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and so I don't know if you guys saw it in the newspaper Saturday, I believe it was, but this was in the Montana Standard. The bid for phase one parrot removal is out. The tailings are going. They're out of here. But this is a series of restoration decisions that, have, that the state of Montana has made in milestones. So January 2013, the Governor Schweitzer <laughs> said they're going out, they're, they're out of here. February of 2015, um, the Natural Resource Damage Program issued its pre preliminary conceptual restoration plan, which was a broad plan to, to show where they were going to remove the tailings. Um, October of 2015, Governor Bullock announced removal is happening for sure. July of 2016, the bid documents were prepared. January 26, 2018, a date that will live in infamy, is when a, concee, a consent decree agreement in principle was, was reached. Um, and then just last Friday, 
parent one, the phase one removal boundary was out to bid. Um, phase one, and I'm going to talk about that in just one second. It, phase one is planned to be done winter of 2019. 2018. I apologize. That's a mistake. Winter of 2018. And so these are the objectives of, of removal. Um, it's just to protect the aquatic resources of Blacktail and Silverbow Creek. Um, eliminate known sources of inorganic contamination to the Alugo Aquifer and enhance Silverbow Creek and Blacktail Creek area riparian corridors. These are the removal boundaries. Um, the total removal boundary encompasses this area right here, but there's also going to be an engineered cap on this entire area right here, and I'm going to show that in a series of successive polygons. That's going to be the phase one removal. And that's happening so that the county has time to, to move the county shops um, to the new location that they were, they were, they, that they were able to choose. Um, and so this is happening first. Then once the county is able to relocate their county, their county shops so they can stay operational, phase two is going to happen. That's removal of this polygon right here. And then construction of an engineered cap. As a part of this, this is what my job is currently, um, is to, um, I designed and implemented and I'm overseeing a performance monitoring, um, groundwater, monitor, groundwater and surface water monitoring plan. We have five transects of highly, um, of high density wells completed at multiple depths of the aquifer, very tight well spacings, multiple wells at each location. Um, PMP implementation happened October, well, so the wells were drilled. We drilled 24 new groundwater wells four new and implemented four new surface water sites. That occurred in October through November of 2017. This is just outside the Chamber of Commerce building. And so what did that do? So we, this is a transect of one of our transects. So this is south, that's north, and you're basically standing at Caw Avenue and you're looking right at the KOA, right? And so there were a lot of wells in that area, um, but the deeper ones were completed at multiple zones in the aquifer. And we, for a number of reasons, you do, that's not really a good idea because you're sort of comparing um, lower, lo the lower wells have much higher heads and it's, it's leading to sample bias. And so you're sort of comparing apples to oranges in, in those lower flow zones. So what we did is we chased those areas because those, there's a lot of good wells down there but we wanted to create a um, nested well system that had m wells completed at the same intervals. And so you, now you're comparing apples to apples. So you could generate a potential surface map for this, you could generate a potential metric surface map for that, and you could start comparing things. And uh, another thing is, so going forward, we're we're doing a lot of monitoring right now prior to removal. We're, we're um, establishing baseline conditions and the way that we're doing that is that we've implemented water quality monitoring devices. We've Im implemented three of these. This is actually James Foltz who's sitting right there. He's interning for us this year. Um, he's one of, one of Robert's students and he's installing one of those things. And, what that's doing is that's giving us a, ba a good baseline of water quality right now prior to removal so that removal happens, the state really wants to know um, what water quality improvements look like over time. They're very concerned about that and so that's kind of what I've been hired on to do. So those are going, those will be installed throughout, those aren't ours, those are the state of Montana's. They, uh, they will stay in those wells uh, throughout their lifespan. So many, many years. And the whole purpose of this is to create a conceptual site model, define those, ba characterize those baseline conditions so that we have a model to work with so that going forward we know the, what the performance of removal is. 
And so the schedule is looking pretty good with, with the, as far as the PMP is going. We're pretty much right here. We've put in the wells. We did the first two sampling events. Um, there's a CCR, there's a, there's a report deliverable due here in a couple day in next month. Um, we're gonna have four water quality events in before parrot removal happens, which is at this now, at this time, they think it's going to be around June or July of this year for phase one. And that's it. That's all I got. Working on this site has really been the pleasure of my life. Um, I really have enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, and I really care about this one. I mean, uh, there was two projects I worked on coming out of graduate school. It was the Berkeley Pit and this one. And I remember the first meeting I ever had, Chris Douglas was in it with Greg Mullen. And we figured, it, and that's sort of what, you know, she was representing SeaTech. And we were, we were just thinking what we could do to start characterizing these parrot tailings. And that was the start of the parrot tailings drilling project. And it really sustained me, my, you know, my career for a long time. Um, and I feel guilty about that, but it's really time to stop paying guys like me to defend removing the parrot tailings. And it's time to move some dirt and it's gonna happen. So that's all I got.